and we appreciate you being uh, on the call today. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker today. Uh, if you could forward the slide. Uh, this is uh, Kate Vitasek. Uh, she is uh, coming to us uh, as a uh, educator and uh, author, a prolific author that you'll see uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, she's uh, connected with the University of Tennessee in the Graduate and Ex Executive Education Program with the Haslam College of Business Administration. So uh, she has uh, been at many, many conferences that I've attended. I met uh, Kate a couple of years ago uh, at a conference, and uh, I'm a big fan. So I expect that you'll get a lot out of our, our call today. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank Kate in advance uh, for getting us into her very busy schedule. We had a bit of a challenge working through it because she travels all over the globe uh, talking uh, to executives and uh, teaching also uh, at the University of Tennessee uh, the concepts that she's going to share with us today. So Kate, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me today and allowing us to share our research and work uh, that we are doing at the University of Tennessee. It's, um, you know, one thing to be a researcher and an academic, but if people don't uh, learn from what your lessons are and don't apply them, it's kind of boring. So I get a lot of energy from working with um, organizations and folks like you who are interested in, in learning yourself. So this is a great win-win for us to, to be able to share our work and have um, so many people from IOP want to learn about what we're doing. Um, so today, you know, Randy, you had asked me to talk a little bit about sourcing business models. You know, business models are all the buzz. Um, you pick up the, the press, Harvard Business Review, or any of the, the popular press, and they're talking about business models. What are business models? Um, and we began looking at sourcing as a business model really back uh, probably about 2009. Um, so we began our original research in 2003, um, was funded by the United States Air Force to study outsourcing deals, in particular large complex outsourcing deals. Think about it, the Air Force you know, buys a $100 million airplane and they have all this logistics and maintenance support. And that $100 million airplane costs $800 million. Um, and it's all the services and stuff after the fact. And they said, is there a better way to outsource? And, and so that's really what led to our work. Uh, and as we began to work with the sourcing aspect of how people procured goods and services, in particular complex services, um, we began to think about sourcing as a business model. And that framed up in, in our, our latest book, actually, is called Strategic Sourcing in the New Economy. And it's about thinking in terms of business models when working with your suppliers. So let's dig in a, a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Um, first, we're going to cover why some of the world's most popular sourcing models are incomplete for today's modern outsourcing. Um, <clears throat> and when I think about how people work today, it, it, they, they really only use a two or three models typically, and they aren't looking at all of their choices. So I want to talk about the most, most popular ones and why some are frustrated and, and why we get calls, why did the Air Force fund our research? Um, because what they were doing wasn't working. Um, so next I want to cover when is it essential to shift along the sourcing continuum to more advanced models, because as you get more complex, you want innovation, um, you want value creation instead of value exchange, you actually need to change the way you approach sourcing of these more complex deals. And lastly, I want to share how you can actually apply sourcing business model theory for any type of outsourcing deal. Um, so let's dig into that agenda and see where we're at. So, Randy, thanks for, for teeing up our, our work and our research. It, it has led to, to six books on the, on the concept. And so today I'm focusing on this one on the when, right, so the strategic sourcing of the new economy. When do I think about doing things differently with my large, complex outsourcing models? Um, you know, with, with these deals, and, and then how do I actually begin to bring in those thinking to working with buyers and suppliers? So discussion topic one, you know, why some of the world's most popular sourcing models are incomplete. So I mentioned, you know, the Air Force funded our original research into a simple question, is there a better way to outsource? 
Uh, and when you think about that question, it really makes me go back to a wonderful quote from Albert Einstein. And he says, the significant problems we face cannot be solved at the same level of thinking we, um, we were at when we created them. And so, you know, I, I have a, a fun way to put this, but my grandma used to tell me, you get what you pay for. And so when we began to look at these complex deals and they weren't doing so well, we, we'd start to dig into the contracts, we'd look at how they approach things, um, what was being delivered versus what was in the contract, what was being bought. And we said, you know, you kind of got what you paid for. Maybe you asked the wrong question. Maybe you used the wrong approach to get what you wanted. Um, and, and why do we do that? It's because procurement over the last 10, 20, 30 years has really started to think about best practices. And the better they are at creating best practices, the more they put these complex sourcing deals in a box. And so they want to treat everything like buying and selling. And so I'm buying and then the supplier sells. And what we find is that you're using the wrong sourcing business model for the wrong situation. It's like putting a square peg in a round hole. So with that in context, let's talk about some of our inspirations. So as a researcher, we go back in and we start to see, you know, what are some of the academics around, some of the leading thinking around how to create different types of contracts for complex deals. How do you think about the economics differently? So I want to spell out two of our inspirations. One is Ian McNeil, and he's kind of the father of relational contracting. And he is a law professor, uh, and, and he really set out this concept of relational contracting theory in the 1960s. And he challenged people. He said, you know, in, um, contracts should be instruments for social cooperation, and they should be governed efficiently only if the parties choose a conscious cooperative attitude. So he was really promoting highly collaborative ways to think about more complex deals, right? And he, he said, we need to buy relationships. The more complex, the more risky. It's not a simple transaction, right? We're not buying a per unit, a per part, right? A per widget, a per hour. We're buy we need to create and craft these, these very cooperative relationships and our contracts need to support cooperative relationships. It's not about a transaction. And as someone, as an outsider coming in, as an academic studying these deals, you know, one of my biggest pet peeves is when, um, especially the lawyers um, or the advisors will go, I got to finish this transaction. We got to get this transaction done. And they've done this deal and they walk away. Well, that deal needs to be sustainable. And it's the people that are going to make that sustainable long term. So he's kind of our inspiration from the legal side. And from the economic side, our inspiration is Oliver Williamson. Now, Williamson won a Nobel Prize in 2009, and he's pretty famous for his work um, on transaction cost economics. And what he did is he studied how organizations' transactions um, affect the cost of doing business. So the way you actually structure the deal um, and the way you're managing that deal can drive cost. Um, and what he suggested is that organizations could, should consider a more flexible, less rigid relational contract for strategic supplier relationships. Again, so these more complex deals like the Air Force was, was coming to us for. He said, use, use flexible frameworks. Don't have these rigid contracts. And I literally, I didn't bring it today, but I have a picture of a contract for the Air Force. And it is, um, we have a, a soldier, and he's about six foot tall. He has a contract on a dolly, and the contract is as tall as him plus half. So the, literally the contract is about, um, you know, 10 feet. It is, it's unbelievable how complex and rigid these contracts are. And, and as we get more rigid, then what happens? Well, we forget what we've bought. We, is that in scope? Is it out of scope? Let me go look at the contract. And we get into measurement minutia. We have all this oversight, and, and so it's very burdensome. And so he was really promoting this concept of a hybrid relationship. Why don't you think about uh, acting as more of a joint venture instead of this buy-sell? Because the more I act as a buyer in a complex deal, I'm actually, without you knowing, you're creating all this burden, this uh, administrative burden that uh, could be managed a lot better. So if I take his concept of make or buy, right, so most organizations when they think about outsourcing, it's a make-buy decision. They spend all this time and energy on make and buy. 
And that's a great thing. They should spend all this time and energy on make buy. And, and to put this into context into what Oliver Williamson teaches, he said, on the buy side, most people use what he called the market. You go to bid, right? It's a highly competitive bid process. You're buying. And on the other side of that continuum is what he called the make, right, the make. Um, but he calls it a corporate hierarchy. It's all this layers of administration. And he said you really need to, at all costs, avoid the corporate hierarchy. And that follows suit into studies by Harvard Business School on core competency. You know, you know, and, and I'm, you know, at IOP, you guys definitely know, if it's not in your core competency, you should be outsourcing it. Right, so this is a traditional make-buy dilemma, right? And people do lots of business cases and they do that. Well, when you actually start to dig in <clears throat> to the actual contracts of what people have bought in these outsourcing deals, there is a, tr um, a flaw in that business model. And here's why we see this flaw. And this is where, where our research really starts to dig in and look at why, why are these deals just, you wanted that, but you didn't get it. You have a green scorecard, but you're frustrated. And it's because the buyer does a, such a wonderful job at specifying, you know, the quantities, the demand, the requirements, the unit price, you know, you've got per unit, per widget, per call, per mile, per, you know, per hour, per whatever, right? And you've done a great job of buying. It's all very well documented in this rigid contract. And so the buyer, by default, assumes that risk because, He's created those specs, and he's challenging the, the suppliers. He's buying apples to apples to apples, and he picks the apple that is typically the lowest price. If he's smart, he's, he's picked the apple with the best value. Well, now let's look at the execution side. So you go over to the supplier, and they've got a, a spec with a price per transaction. So if I'm a call center supplier and I get paid per call, I love calls. If I'm an IT service provider and I get paid per headcount, I love headcount. If I'm a warehouse provider, I love pallets of stuff. The more stuff you have, the more money I make. So you get the picture, right? No matter what type of outsourcing deal, the more the supplier sells, the more profit they make. And so they have this us versus them mentality, right? So the buyer wants a lower price. The supplier wants a higher price. They want more transactions. The buyer wants more efficiency. So you're basically at odds with each other. It's a win-lose game, right? So you're creating these, these win-lose situations. So what's happened in the outsourcing space, really in the last 10 years, um, but uh, we've seen the, the earliest deal we have ever seen um, with a performance-based or managed service philosophy dates back to the 1960s. But about 10 years ago, you started to see the emergence of what's known as performance-based or also known as managed services. So in the IT and BPO sector, these would be known as managed services deals. In the facilities management, they're known as GMP deals, gross maximum price. So what happened is then the buyer said, you know what, you're the expert, why am I telling you how? I'm just gonna ha give you the box and your job is to make the box more efficient. Because you know what, you're right, I am not the expert. I get that core company stuff. I've read about you know, Harvard Business School and, and their core company stuff. So they really started to, to get that, that concept right. And they created these managed services deals. But here's the problem, that shifts risk to the supplier. So that's good because the supplier is actually you know, supposed to be better than you. But if we still have a rigid contract and we work to come up with what the box is, then the supplier is going to sit there and go, well, that's not in scope. I'll have to charge you for that, right? And so we get this scope creep battle. So then the lawyers got smart, and then they started to add scope, you know, these scope sweeps. And, again, you still have tension. And it's just tension. It's just a different kind of tension in that relationship. And so what we see as academics coming in to study these deals, whether it's a transactional deal or a performance-based deal, what we found was that for the lion's share of the time, yeah, there's some bad service providers out there, but in general, buyers are getting what they paid for. They're getting what they contracted, and they may not realize that what they contracted isn't really what they wanted. So think about that. The business people were on the back, you know, had dinner, the back of a napkin, had this great idea. It went through the procurement process, and there was a translation error. And, and, and so, hmm, we've lost some value there. And then it goes through the contracting process. 
risk is shifted back and forth, and what you contract isn't necessarily what you wanted. And so what we found is that service providers are, you know, meeting metrics, um, but the people are still unhappy. There's tension, and there's all kinds of tension, and it comes out in lots of different ways. I'm not going to go into that today. But we kind of called this a watermelon scorecard because it was green on the outside, but red on the inside. And one of the co companies that we studied in outsourcing was, was Procter & Gamble, and they called this green, green scores red faces. Um, and I'm sure you all have all experienced some, some deals with watermelon scorecards. But how do I prevent this? How do I actually think about getting what I paid for, and especially in complex deals? How do I give the supplier uh, enough runway to where it's their core competency, but I'm comfortable in, in, in how I translate that through the requirements and metrics? And that's where we began to look at the, you know, of the deals we studied, which ones were the most successful. And the most successful created a hybrid deal. Well, now remember Oliver Williamson, he talked about a hybrid, right? It's not make or buy, it's kind of something in the middle. And we called these vested because these best deals had a relationship where the buyer's success was the supplier's success and the supplier success was the buyer success. The more that they worked in a highly collaborative fashion to create value and drive innovation and desired outcomes to de-risk the deal, and the more they worked together to solve these kind of more complex, higher elevated problems, the more they each won. So it's shared risk, shared reward. So now the buyer specifies the outcomes and prioritizes their efforts, and the, and the supplier develops solutions, and they're motivated to improve the process and decrease costs because their contract is physically structured differently. So the process of how they went and created their deal structure, very, very different than a performance-based or a transactional deal. So in theory now, the, the supplier says, the less I use, the more profit I make, or the more innovative I am, the more profit I make. So with that in mind, you know, we began to, to, to take our research and write one of our books, Vested, How P&G, McDonald's, and Microsoft are Redefining Winning in Business Relationships. And by the way, kudos, I'm going to give a shout out to the IOP folks because um, P&G for their Jump Lane Assault deal and, Microsoft, and McDonald's for, I mean, Microsoft for their uh, Accenture deal on back office procure to pay. Both of those deals have won IAOP GEO awards for innovation in outsourcing. So those are two of the deals that we studied, and they get it, really doing a good job of getting it right. So let's put this in context now for procurement professionals. So, you know, the buyers, the, the operations people know they want to outsource. So they go to the procurement team, and they say, hey, I need to do this outsourcing. And procurement kind of has this one-size-fits-all mentality, this best practice mentality where they're buying. You know, so they've got this make or buy, and they take this buy concept and use in the market highly competitive bids, specify the requirements, apples to apples. And what Williamson would say is that's kind of like using the wrong model. It's a square peg in a round hole. So we need to move up this continuum. So we began to work with procurement professionals and really understand how they bought complex services. And we mapped out the, the ways or the models on Williamson's continuum. So on the left side, we have very transactional deals, basic providers and approved suppliers. And in the middle, we began to have more strategic or relational contracts. So we move into a preferred provider relationship, a performance-based or managed services relationship, or to a vested model. And then, you know, if it's, if it's something that is such a strength, such a core competency, we should not be buying at all. We should be investing and creating our own shared services model or even doing an acquisition or a joint venture with things like an equity partnership. So instead of just this make buy, now we have a continuum with seven models. And as you look at contracts, right, and how people were contracting, what you'd start to see is that some people wanted outcomes, um, but they were buying output, 
right? Green scores, red faces. Some people wanted outputs and they were buying transactions. Again, green scores, um, red faces. And, and the goal then is to teach procurement and not just procurement, but the operations people who are going to support these deals, pick your model that is going to support your business and then align your contract to, to that. So don't come up with a, your grand vision on the back of a napkin and then get the translation wrong in procurement and then in legal. It all has to align, right? So what you're trying to do is what you buy and is what you contract for. So with that in mind to the next discussion topic is when is it essential to shift along the sourcing continuum to more advanced models? And I think when, when I talk to folks um, from IOP, you know, y'all are already moving up that continuum to managed services deals. But you're not always architecting the deal right. So you have good intent to shift up the continuum, but the execution falls out in procurement or in contracting. And there are actually are some deals that are vested. So, for example, the P&G and the, the, the Microsoft um, two GEO award winners, those are both what we would classify as excellent outcome-based vested deals. So let's look at the decisions you have to make. So you're deciding you want to outsource or you have an existing outsourcing deal and you want to maybe think about doing it differently. You know, is there more value that could be created? So there's two key questions here. So the, the first question that you want to, to look at is what is your relational relationship model? Or it, does the relationship matter, right? So if you're buying a pen, you don't need a relationship. But in complex outsourcing deals, you should be having a relationship a relational type of a contract. The relationship does matter. So that means we're going to think about governance. That means we're going to think about um, our behaviors differently. It means we're going to think about the cultural aspect and is there a good cultural fit in that relationship. And the second consideration that we need to think about is the economic model. And here what I'm talking about is do you want transaction-based economics per hour, per unit, per widget, per, you know, per mile, um, per headcount. Do you want outputs? So outputs would be you pay the supplier for SLAs or guaranteed savings glide paths. This is where you start to think about those managed services deals because we're buying SLAs. We're buying guarantees or maybe penalties against those. And then the last type of economic model is outcome-based. And an outcome-based economic model is really boundary spanning, and you're looking at business outcomes, and we have that shared risk, shared reward. So remember that slide I shared earlier about vested, shared risk, shared reward? You win together, you lose together. Um, that's what we're really talking about when we get to these outcome-based deals. It's about value creation and innovation, and you can't just push that risk over to the supplier. You have to work together with shared risk and shared rewards to get to these, some of these more advanced, complex, problem-solving things that you're trying to do. So those are the two key paths. What relationship model do you want and what economic model do you want? So if I take those questions and I was to map this into a simple matrix, right? And up at the top here, I have, you know, the relationship model. And on the side, I have the economic model. Well, what you can see then is you draw a simple, uh, you know, map against the seven models to that. So an outcome-based model with a relationship contract is vested. An output-based or a performance-managed-based deal, right, um, with relationship uh, contract would be a managed services or performance-based deal. So I'm looking at output-based economics. And then lastly, if I'm looking at transaction-based economics and a relational contract, I'm more of a preferred provider model. Now, if I'm buying pens or office supplies, I'm probably using a basic or an approved type of provider model because, again, I don't need to have a relationship. I don't care about outputs. I just want the transaction. Give me a pen. It's on time. And if I have investment-based, then that creates a whole different type of scenario. So what kind of economics do you want for your investment-based model? And more often than not, those are often shared risk, shared reward. Think about a joint venture, 
right? By design, a joint venture shares the economics, shares the risk, shares the reward. But when I'm outsourcing, I've got the, the choice between a vested, a performance-based, a preferred, a basic, or a approved uh, provider model. So let's look at how we should think about this with regards to a couple dimensions. So if I look at my relational contracting model, right, should I be transactional, relational, or investment-based? A key factor here is dependency. The more that we are dependent on the supplier, the more that we should be shifting up the continuum. So for example, if there are no suppliers that can do what you need, you're going to have to make an investment. There are no suppliers. If you have a small number of suppliers, for example, in the facilities management space, you know, if you're a large company, um, global scale, global platform, there's really only about six suppliers. I have a quote from, from the head of Intel's procurement for logistics spend category, and he said, Kate, there's a thousand third-party logistics providers, but there's really only about five that can do what we need at our scale and our capabilities. So dependency is a very important factor. So as you have more dependency on a supplier, then the more you need to create these relational contracts. The relationship does matter. Then when I look at the economics, how much value is there? So think about value exchange versus value creation, right? So as I want more innovation, as I want to create value, I need to move up to either an output-based or an outcome-based economic model. Those are the kind of the two big criteria. But when we look at mapping those models against those criteria, I've created a real simple two-by-two two matrix here. Right? And what you can start to see is that the more dependent and the more value I want, I need to shift up that continuum. So as we look at contracts, we'll often see a large outsourcing deal, and they wanted outcomes, but they really bought a preferred provider model. Right? They, were, they were using transactional economics, but starting to build some governance into that, starting to you know, think about the relationship but they should have probably been a performance-based or managed services deal or even a vested deal. So as dependency and value, you know, we, we have more and more of those, you start to then decide which model do I want. Now this is a very oversimplified, you know, two, two by two graphic of that. So what really happens is you've got lots and lots of suppliers. So I always say P&G has 80,000 suppliers. They can't all be vested. Yes you've read the story about P&G and Joe Blanc, saw you've read the GEO Award, you know, it's a, a fantastic story about how to get outsourcing right. Um, but they, they aren't all like that. So you take your 80,000 suppliers, and it's like putting them through a funnel, you know, and using those criteria, what, should I be developing a relationship and what kind of economics? And so based on those two questions that you want to ask, you'll go through an exercise and you'll segment your suppliers into one of those seven buckets. And, and again, one of the seven buckets is actually I don't even have suppliers. I insource. If I'm going to create a shared services, or I'm going to go buy the capability with a acquisition or a joint venture. So you begin to look at your segmentation. And this segmentation process is very, very different than the traditional procurement process. So if I have any procurement people on the phone, you're probably used to the uh, the method for uh, the Krausic matrix, right, where you try to leverage your supplier. Here you're actually trying to not use your power, but to use collaboration to in, in incentives to work with the supplier in a very different way. So there are 25 attributes, and you will go through an exercise, and then that segmentation out will come how you should treat that supplier. You can do this for all your suppliers, or you could just do it one deal at a time. Oftentimes, people will come and they'll be, have a specific supplier relationship in mind, and they'll want to compare how they're actually working today with how they should have been working with them. So there, there are actually 25 total attributes. We have a tool called the Business Model Mapping Tool, and for anyone that's on the webinar, if you want it, we'll download it. You, you can download it. It's a, it's a free open source um, um, toolkit, but it really goes back to that dependency, your core competency, the degree of risk, 
um, the potential value to create, the nature of the work scope and the task, um, the criticality of the work, and also your simple commercial preferences. If you don't like risk, then you need to create a deal that is going to shift risk. So a vested deal may not be a good fit for you because you don't feel comfortable with sharing risk and sharing rewards. Um, and, and so you really have to look at all 25 of these and it creates a map. And from that map, you then can now decide which model's best. So let's get to the last point um, lessons for, for today's webinar. And that's how do you apply sourcing business model theory to any type of outsourcing deal? Doesn't matter if it's facilities management, logistics, IT, BPO, um, the, the process works uh, universally. And the lesson that, that I like to share is that systems thinking is very key. Now think of a system, a slinky is a system. You, you, you know, it's a perfect little system. You put it at the top of the stair, you let it go, and it walks itself down the stairs. So if you've never played with a slinky, you can go Google what a slinky is. But it's a little system. A, a, the heating and, and air conditioning in your home is a system. It gets cold outside, it knows that you're, the heat's supposed to come on. It gets hot outside, it knows the air conditioning's supposed to come on. So a system um, looks at the whole, and that's what we do in business model theory, is we look at the whole aspects of that deal, not just the statement of work and the price, right? So there's more to it. And so we need rules for each system. And these, these rules won't be a surprise, I think, to anyone in, in the outsourcing community because you kind of do this anyway. You're just not packaging up your, how you manage and follow these rules in the right contract. You, know, you thought about them on the back of the napkin, but they got translated wrong in procurement and then translated, you know, lost more in translation and contracting. But we first need to understand our business model. You know, which model's right? Invested, a managed services deal, a transactional deal. So once you've made that decision, then you look at the scope of work. Then you look at the metrics and the performance management. Then you look at the pricing. And then you look at governance. So a contract and the design of that contract needs to include all five of these rules. And in the business model mapping toolkit that you can download. I've got a, a little cheat sheet here, and I know you're not going to be able to read this, and, and it's okay. I'm, I'm fine with that um, because I just want you to kind of get the theory. You've got the seven models across the top, and you've got these five rules and the kind of the contractual components down the side. So what we teach people is how to design or architect a contract that will help people get what they want, not what they paid for. So it's kind of a cheat sheet. So let's look a, a little bit more in detail. This is a little bit bigger one. You still aren't going to be able to see it, but I've got a, another blowout um, as we do it. So again, we've got our business models across the top, and you have kind of the rules down the left-hand side. So in a vested model, the economic model is outcome-based, and you have a relational contract. If I want a basic provider, right, it's very transaction-based per unit, per widget, right? And I don't need a relationship. I'm simply doing a PO. I don't even need a contract. So this is a good way to help people sense check, are they actually designing or architecting these deals properly? And the next couple of slides, I wanted to make sure that anyone who downloaded the slides kind of had the cheat sheet without having to go download the toolkit and get, get, get that. But you can then see, this is exactly what I was talking about. So looking at the business model, right, what's the cheat sheet? Or if you want output-based economics, wow, that's a performance-based. I would still need a relational contract because I need to collaborate. But it, it's not highly collaborative. It may not be highly transparent, right? But I'm, I'm definitely starting to collaborate in a more strategic way. We're in a preferred provider relationship. I I'm, I'm, have a merging collaboration, right? So each one of these, then, each one of these rules has kind of a little little cheat sheet. And in our book, we actually go into a lot of detail. So think about the statement of work, right? In a vested deal, we focus on the what, not the how. In a performance-based deal, we focus on the what with limited emphasis on the how. But in a preferred supplier, we're still talking about the who and the how, 
right? So I'm the buyer. Don't get me wrong. I want you to do it the way I want it. You may be strategic, but here's my way. Um, and so you're going to craft a statement of work very different for a vested deal than a preferred deal. And that's the, the key lesson is how do you craft these deals, right? You need to come up with a system or a swim lane. So each, once you've decided that business model, craft and design that deal so that it actually hangs together. Um, so I'm not going to go over each one of these, but I definitely wanted to leave them in the PowerPoint deck so you could begin to see the cheat sheet in a little bit bigger context. Um, so again, the metrics are different. The money's different, right? In a vested deal, we have a pricing model with value-based incentives. In a preferred provider deal, we're typically in a fixed price for a transaction, and we're focusing on rebates. I'll give you more volume. You give me less, you know, less price. Um, in a preferred provider deal, it's, it's price, and it typically has penalties based on SLA. So governance is also very different, right? As we, we get to these more complex deals, we need to put in governance, right? A very good governance. So with that in mind, I wanted to leave you with a resource that you could download and begin to interact with, right? So um, we have a, a free open source um, toolkit. You can download it. Um, and so if you have any questions, you can simply email me. My email is kvitasic at utk.edu. And I can send this to you. It's also on our website at vestedway.com. And I encourage you, if you like to read, um, pick up our book. Right, strategic sourcing the new economy because it goes into great detail about how to think about procurement and sourcing in a very different way. And the first chapter is really interesting because it, it specifically challenges um, what I'll call some gold standard procurement best practices. And people go, oh my gosh, you know, that's, that we've been doing that way for 30 years. The Krogic matrix, you know, that's embedded in how we speak and, and work. I was like, mm, yeah, but if it's a really strategic supplier that has ability to create value and drive innovation, you really want to leverage them? Really? Um, and so it challenges some of the conventional norms of procurement. And really, we try to teach people to think more logically and using systems-based thinking to become designers or architects of these deals. Don't just buy an outsourcing deal, design an, uh, uh, an outsourcing deal. So with that in mind, I'll turn it over to questions and I'll leave my uh, email address up because if anyone does want a copy of our toolkit, we are very happy to send that to you. It is open source. You can use that um, to help you in your next outsourcing deal. Okay, Kate, that was great. Um, my apologies for pronouncing your last name incorrectly. So I should have asked you that uh, in advance. Um, mine is Veter, not Vetter, right? So um, let's go through some of the questions here that we're getting. The first question here is, uh, what are some of the attributes in a sustainable relationship? So you talked about, you know, the deal needs to have sustainability what would be some of the attributes that would be uh, inherent in having a, a long-term sustainable relationship? Yeah, and, and so because you're talking about a relationship, now we have a choice, right, in our source and continuum. You'll either have a preferred, a performance-based, or a vested relationship. And the sustainability comes in governance, right? And also in the whole flexibility of your contract. Because in a, relate, in a sustained relationship, I say business happens. So what you bought today may not be what you need tomorrow, right? Um, because there could be a hurricane. There could be whatever technology changes, right? So we have new technologies that we didn't have before. And so we constantly need to be, be changing. And the way you manage that change is through your governance. And so... Governance then has, again, in our, if I look to our cheat sheet, which I've pulled up, different rules. So in a vested relationship, it's going to be very insight-oriented, and we're going to use strategic relationship management. We're going to create a joint and proactive transformation management. We are buying the future. We are buying change, right? Um, 
we're going to have a joint exit management plan. How do we, we overcome um, differences, disputes, to always make sure that we're fair and balanced in the contract? Because if our economics get out of balance, right, then it creates tension. And so this is why invested, we have a pricing model because the model has to, the pricing model changes based on the dynamic nature of business. Um, and, and, you know, if I compare that to a performance-based deal, a managed services deal, I still have, I have oversight emphasis, right? So I'm, I'm more oversight, and it's about SRM, Supplier Relationship Management. And you've probably read in the trade press and different um, sessions, I know there's been different sessions about SRM, Supplier Relationship Management. So you're clearly still the buyer, and the supplier is clearly still the supplier. When I move to vested, it's more like a joint venture without a joint venture. You're, you're more of a partnership. So you see how I made that leap from SRM, supplier relationship management, to strategic relationship management. I say invested. We manage the business with the supplier. We don't manage the supplier. Um, and then look at how we would, we would uh, uh, look at um, transformation and innovation. In, in a performance-based deal, the supplier is innovating within the box. They've taken a commitment to make improved efficiencies to meet SLAs or a cost savings glide path in the box, right? So you're using metrics, SLAs, um, to drive that improvement. Where invested, it really is about <clears throat> more pilots and, wow, we could try this and have we done this before? Let's test this out. So it's more about innovation and testing than about, you know, SLAs of the box. Um, but governance is very essential to sustaining any type of relationship. But the type of governance you put in is different for a preferred, a performance-based, or a vested deal. Ah, that, that, that's very good. I, I appreciate that answer there. Um, we do have another question here. How would you respond to a supplier who wants to be collaborative, but whose actions are very transactional? Well, that's a great one, too. So let me go back to here, this guy, right? Um, and this is the vision and intent of the relationship. So if somebody, well, first, it takes two to tango on collaboration. So just because the supplier wants to be collaborative, if you don't want to be collaborative, then you're not going to get there, right? So... Again, think about this continuum. So, so there, let's say they're saying they want to be collaborative, but the behaviors aren't there. Then in a preferred supplier relationship, we may just be focusing on value-added capabilities. All right, well, let's collaborate to see what kind of, you know, continuous improvement effort we could do, right? And, and so, but as I move up that continuum, say in a vested deal, you have in the contract um, a, a shared vision, and you, the contract actually spells out that the intent of the contract is to drive trans collaborative transformation, to work together to drive innovation to achieve the future. So you didn't buy today, right? So you didn't buy SLAs. You bought transformation of the business. And, and I love the Microsoft uh, One Finance example that won a GEO award. You know, they'll, they'll tell you they, they didn't buy. They didn't, they didn't pick Accenture as a partner because Accenture was – you know, the best at the lowest price. You know, Accenture is not inexpensive for what they do from a BPO environment. But what they did is they said, Accenture's got a very good fit for us, and we're buying the future. We are buying transformation of back office procure to pay. Yes, we need someone to pay our invoices and to process our bills and to, you know, set up new suppliers, but we're buying transformation of back office procure to pay. So in the contract itself, the whole tone in the master services agreement right up front says the purpose is for transformation. And then, then to talk about the behaviors, right? Where did I go here? Yeah, where did I go? So here's the behaviors. Um, we actually have, where am I at? Right, I am, yeah, right here. Um, it is, it, it's just not in here, but... There's a thing called a statement of intent. So if you dig into the book, it's very clear. This is just the cheat, cheat, cheat here. But it actually talks about the behaviors. 
And so the, beha- the collaborative behaviors become part of the contract. So they're called guiding principles. Um, it's actually a formal thing that you put into the contract. And so you're agreeing on what those collaborations are and what those behaviors would look like. So you're contracting for collaborative behaviors. You're contracting for certain types of, um, uh, I guess really it's behaviors if you look at it, right? So there's six guiding principles. One would be honesty, one's integrity. Um, We've seen people put in things like courage to change. Um, But the team sits down and says, what do we want this relationship to look like? And that goes into your contract. And that is actually used every day in your governance structure. Yeah, so perhaps if you if you think about the question, how would you respond to a supplier who wants to collaborative but whose actions are very transactional, that, that may go back to the root of what type of relationship or contract do you have? Because oftentimes, yeah. wouldn't you say that providers are going to map their behavior to the way that the contract is written versus the way that they would like to perhaps behave otherwise? Yes, um, and and absolutely. So they will map their behavior to what you bought. So they may say they want a collaborative behavior. You know, you want collaboration, they want collaboration. But if you're paying for transactions and you've, you're micromanaging them, right, you're managing the supplier instead of managing the business, um, they're, they're going to have to, by contract, give you what you bought. And they will also mirror your behavior. So if you're not collaborative, why would they be collaborative, right? So they may be trying to right. entice you to a better place, but their, their behaviors may be anchoring you down. So it's very you know, common. There's root causes behind that. So we do a we we recommend a tool created by a couple professors called the compatibility and trust assessment. Uh, I did a LinkedIn blog on this a couple weeks ago, but it's a really great um, anonymous tool um, survey where the buyer and the supplier take that and it, and it digs into why the behaviors are not where they need to be and the perception disconnects. Um, and again, it, it's um, not something that we've developed at the University of Tennessee, but we're huge fans of it. It's called the Compatibility and Trust Assessment. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can email me, and I can give you some information about what that looks like. Um, but you have to get to these behaviors, and the, the whole concept of ESSID is based on behavioral economics, right? We, 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 are, we do what we're rewarded to do, and what we're rewarded to do is in the contract. And what we, if we manage detailed level metrics, we're going to get detailed level metrics. We're not going to get outcomes. If we micromanage the supplier, you're probably going to get the B team or the C team because the best employees at the supplier don't like to be micromanaged. They hate it. They want to go work with somebody that's a cool client, that is, does like innovation, that does, does want to collaborate to do cool stuff. Right? So, again, you get what you pay for. Yeah, definitely. Got another <clears throat> another one here. It says, when and how do you get legal counsel on board with a collaborative vested relationship? They tend to want to be very precise in what's spelled out in a contract. Yeah, that's actually something that um, we're working on now. That'll be our next book. Um, so this last book was geared towards educating procurement people um, about relational contracts and shifting, you know, from being very prescriptive in the work. Um, and, but we have a great white paper on our website, uh, and it's called Unpacking Relational Contracts. And it's actually written with um, um, the IO, um, International Association for Contract and Commercial Management, IACCM. So they are like, uh, it's like IOP, but for contracting people and lawyers. Uh, and so it talks about relational contracts. So remember early on, I mentioned Ian McNeil. The concept of a relational contract isn't new. We didn't invent it, right? It's been talked about, but it is not the norm. In the 1960s, people thought Ian McNeil was weird. They're like, you're too far out there. We want to have more rigid contracts. There was this little battle between the 60s and 70s and the 80s where people would say, oh, relational con- that's just so stupid. Why don't you have a more rigid contract? Um, um, and it really wasn't until Oliver Williamson came in from an economics perspective and said, you know what, you, 
it's impossible to manage and have success against a 10-foot contract. And that's an extreme. But look at some of your contracts. How many pages are they? In the Procter & Gamble contract with Jones Lang Assault, dining services, worldwide dining services, um, 60 countries, 130 locations, the entire statement of work for dining is six bullets. It's not even half a page, right? And so who's an expert in managing dining services? Jones Lang Assault, right? And so that's just one area. So you have to get the lawyers to feel comfortable with that because they want to be prescriptive. They're like, are you business guys? I don't know, right? So you have to put the whole system in context. And when you do these deals, the lawyers need to be on board from day one. Um, and, and we don't really work on the uh, teach people on the, the lower end of the continuum. We really focus on performance-based invested deals. But when you craft a deal, um, the lawyer is actually intimately involved early on. And there's a whole education process. Because if people don't understand the type of model that they're buying, they won't craft a good deal. And that's endemic in the industry. People go out and they buy a transaction. You know, oh, i got to get this transaction done, right? Oh, you know, I'm doing a deal. But they don't think about the architecture of the deal. And so we, we would advocate to have some education before you ever decide to move forward, right? So when you think about these rules, you know, the first rule that you want to look at is your business model. Make your decision about what you're buying, what type of model you're buying with your supplier, and then craft the components. Right? No, there's no, you know, very clear why rule one is rule one. You can't think about pricing, you can't think about metrics, you can't think about the scope of work until you've decided which business model is right for you. And you're going to design that business model based on, you know, design principles. Yeah, that's 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 very good. Um, what percentage of the deals today would you say are are in the vested uh, relational approach versus the conventional approach? I mean, is there a is there a, a, a movement afoot, or is this you know, there's still not enough people that 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 grasp the concept? Yeah, so I don't have any hard data on that, but the ICCM did a survey of their members. And they estimate that the vast majority, 90%, high 90s, are transactional. So you're saying you want a strategic partnership, and you go look at that, and what have you bought per widget, per hour? Think about all the IT deals, labor arbitrage. Those are preferred provider deals, if you look at the economics. So they are starting to shift to output-based. They're starting to say outcome-based, right? So we start to get, especially like in the IT deals, we move to SLAs. Right, so that industry's moved to SLAs, but they haven't moved to necessarily outcomes as well. So there is a trend, there is a shift for sure. Um, you know, the sourcing industry group um, it now teaches um, sourcing business model theory. Um, they're real advocates for um, sharing the thought that we need to shift up the continuum. Quit saying you want a strategic partnership. Quit saying you want innovation. When you look at that contract, you did not buy innovation. You did not buy collaboration. You did not buy cooperative behaviors. You did not buy a flexible pricing model. You bought a price for a, a widget. And I think of it as the activity trap. Right? Um, so we pay for an activity. We measure an activity. So we're going to get an activity. So you can say you want your supplier to be collaborative and innovative and strategic all day long. But you know what? That's not what you bought. Right, yeah, that's for sure. So, well, Kate, we are at the end of our time, and uh, we've got uh, one minute left, and uh, we might as well end on time. Appreciate it. We uh, don't have any other questions in the queue. So, again, I'd like to thank you very much. Uh, you can reach out to Kate. Uh, we'll have uh, IOP, Kim, and, and Nicole. We'll get this posted uh, up on the site with a uh, link. And if you have colleagues that have not been able to take advantage of this time today, uh, please point them to that. So, Kate, thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Kim and Nicole, for getting this all set up. And uh, everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Kate. Thanks, everybody.